Thank you for coming. This is the first in a series of three, I believe, that Hans will be doing on the iron industry in the West Milford region, area, regional area in the Highlands. Um, he's starting out with uh, colonial iron ore smelting. Am I correct? Now, I always, when we, when we have the tours of the museum, I always show them the exhibits for the um, iron industry. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I generally know the process, but I really don't know the whole process. So I, hopefully at the end of these, these three uh, presentations from Hans, we'll be pretty well versed in the iron industry, at least from what we know that uh, occurred in the colonial times and you know into the early, uh, before the Victorian times, right? It ended no, I'm, I'm just going colonial. To, I will just dedicate my time to colonial times. That's the area I have been studying. Okay. okay. Now Hans is would like everyone to know he's not an expert, and he doesn't propose, uh, you know, uh, doesn't uh, say that he's an expert. But he um, is very knowledgeable about the subject. He has studied it, and he would like to share the some of the things that he has learned with everyone else, so we become a little bit more uh, uh, familiar with the topic and maybe interested in it. And who knows where it'll go from there. Do you, would you like me to say anything else? Nope. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. As you can see, the title, it's a brief introduction. Why it's a brief introduction? I don't want that it's considered like a research paper that you write in a historic magazine or, or to make a formal presentation at the New York historical society or something like that. It's just a brief introduction of what was iron smelting in the area that today we know as West Milford. Um, this painting, I found it many months ago in the internet, and I forgot at that time to write down where I took it. And thank God my son, found a page in the internet that it says reverse image finding, something as similar as face recognition. He put it there, and immediately he found where it, I took it that time. How many times we look at something and we don't write it down? And this one is in Germany. It's in the Eiserfrey, Mechernich, Germany area, in the, very close to Bonn. And what I like it because I think that Long put was more or less similar to this at that time in the 1760s. The layout of the water wheel, the small furnace, the loading bridge, everything it's really looks at was old. And that furnace that where this is in Germany, it's also run with charcoal, not with coal. That was very it's very important. Why is iron so important? We see iron all around the world, any place, at home, the chairs, in our cars, combined with other metals, combined with plastics, with wood. We find every, every place we find iron. Today, most are steel, not iron itself. But it's already known for over 5,000 years. The people knew that it was existing, and most probably, like many other things, it was just found without searching for it, because they didn't know how to look for things and searching. Most probably, they used rocks to put around the fireplace, and something they saw, that oh, there's something in there. And that was iron that came out from those stones. Iron ore, most probably, that's the way it came from. As I mentioned, where do we use iron? Oh, the, the list is infinite. We can save the tools there. In our body, hemoglobin has iron, and that's what brings and circulates the oxygen in our bodies through the blood. We find it also in our tools, in our appliances. Just name them again. All around we find where to use iron. And has been used for many times, many years. But we are looking through this list. We can make practically say, oh, that's today. But how was it really 
with our colonial settlers that were here in West Milford or in any other place around the world. Their needs were very, very different. That I will explain in another slide later on. Around the 1700s, well, why I choose the 1700s? 1764 is when iron started being produced in this area with the arrival of Peter Hasenclever. And that's the reason I started my presentation thinking on this century of the 1700s. I always say there were other people here before, all those Germans that came with Hasenclever. They were the trappers, the traders, and the farmers. But in many places here in the highlands, farmers were not really using the land for one reason. What do we grow here more than any other thing? Rocks. Exactly. So it was not good for farmland. Exactly, that's the main reason. The grant we had here, the Dutch, the French, the English, and all of them were period of time acquiring property from the Indians. And at the end of the 1700s, they were practically all the Lenapis were gone. But these settlers, they needed also to have, they had their needs for iron. And they had it first, like here, nails. They needed the nails to build their houses. That was one of the main reasons they were using iron at the very, very early beginning. Also, for the items used in the kitchen, for cooking and for heating. Here we have the pots, the reflectors. It was an iron plate that was in the back of the um, furnace, of the um, fireplace, in order to reflect the heat into the house. And we have all here, all the utensils, and also the tools needed for working in the farm. So that was the main reason they, were, they needed. And at that time, all the iron products came from England. They had to import everything from England. And it came to a period of time that in England, they were running out of wood to make charcoal to uh, make the smelting of the iron ore. And that was a major problem because England was importing iron from Germany, from Sweden, inclusive from Russia at that time. They were running out. And they said, we have to start producing iron in the colonies. But what is iron? Iron is the most abundant metal or item in our planet Earth. It's practically about an 80% is it's, it's, uh, iron. And we see that it combines with many materials, mainly with oxygen. What happens if we leave an iron tool outside in the garden? It rusts. It's a very reactive material. Now, we say always it got wet, and that's the reason it rusted. It's not the water that makes the iron rusting, it's the one that produces the initial chemical reaction with the oxygen of the air. And that's the reason iron is not found like gold, silver, and copper as metals in the mines. It's always as an iron ore, as an iron oxide. And there are different type of iron oxides as I mentioned, the beginning, all the iron goods came directly from England, the colonies. There was a famous order in 1750 when they started and wanted to produce some iron in the colonies that they could produce some iron, but only as a rough iron. Not, not any tools, not any items made out of iron. They had to import that still from England. So the rough iron, was sent back to England, converted there, and came back. So that's the reason it started already in the 1760s. 
in the 1600s to produce some irons in Virginia, not far away from Richmond, and in Massachusetts by Saugus, north of Boston. But Cornelius Port came in here the area looking not for gold or silver, because they knew that they didn't have gold or silver like they had it in South America or in Mexico, and the Spaniards found those. He was looking mainly for copper, but he saw that they were really black stones and reddish stones, and says, oh, that must be iron. And he detected and started mining <coughs> iron in the Ringwood area. Later, he sold all the property to the Ogden family, and they started with a little furnace in 1742 in Ringwood. Then they practically ran out of people to run. They didn't have people to the expertise to continue producing. By the way, I'm concentrating only the iron furnaces of, in the area of West Milford. I am not including Wawayanda. I am not including Clinton. I am not including uh, uh, the one in Bloomingdale or in the area. I'm trying to concentrate only for West, what West, today is West Milford. Why? Because if not, we will never finish. We have to concentrate in a certain area. And you know for sure as a teacher, you start producing and writing a paper or a presentation, and you start getting so much information, and suddenly you have a presentation that will be three hours. And it says, you only have 20 minutes. <laughs> it's so difficult to put everything. Then you have really to search only for a certain area. It's similar as genealogy. Many people want to say, I want to see the whole family. They will never be enabled. They have to concentrate in one or two branches. If not, you never finish. Then in 1742, and they stopped producing. At that time, Hassan Clever arrived, and he bought immediately the one in Ringwood. It's very close to the Ringwood Manor. The remains are still there, and some of the stones were used for the big um, wall that is the moment you arrive at the curve to go inside into Ringwood Manor. Many of the stones of the furnace were used for that wall, and that's when Longpont and Charlottenburg were built in, during these years. But what was important to produce iron? You needed ingredients, iron ore existing. Wood for making charcoal. We had it here in plenty. The land, where they could cut them, etc., because they, the land was not good for farming, so they started harvesting their trees, cutting the trees. They had also the limestone needed as a flux into the furnace and to absorb all the ingredients not needed, like um, silica, sulfur, phosphorus. They needed to take it out, and that was good done with the limestone. The limestone mines, they were up in Sussex, not far away. They were big uh, iron mines there, uh, uh, limestone mines and a lot of water, no electricity. So they didn't have electric motors, no gasoline motors. The only water power they had was the water power in order to move all the machinery and to inject the air into the furnaces, as we will see a little bit later. Iron ores. There are many, many different types of iron ores, but the most important ones that are used to produce iron are uh, the hematite, with this chemical formula that has about 70% iron, the magnetite that is found here with around 72%, and the limonite that's similar to the hematite, but mixed with, uh, has a water of hydration, hydration, and that was the one that was found in the pines in South Jersey. That's the one that was normally used to make the plumery to, to obtain through, not through a furnace, but by heating and hammering 
the ore with charcoal to produce iron. It was a long process and not very productive. And these are typical fit pictures of those type of minerals. And it's interesting, the emmatite is not here very clear, but it's reddish. And you remember hemoglobin, hematite, that's the reason of the name hematite. I have to find, to see if I find a better picture for this. What do we need? What I mentioned already before. We need, of course, the iron ore. I put here oxides of iron because they are different type of oxides. And you need the charcoal as a heat source and also for the chemical reaction. The limestone, the calcium carbonate, many times they didn't have calcium carbonate and we have found at Long Pond seashells that they brought from the shore and they calcinated them in order to make calcium oxide and that was also used in place of limestone. You need the oxygen, a lot of oxygen to really burn all the carbon and produce the high heat over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And to produce this, you needed a lot of water to move the water wheels and those water wheels to move the bellows to inject air into the furnace. What were the products that came out? The waste that was the slag, all the impurities that, had, that the iron ore had, and the iron as a producer, the metal. That's what came out of this. But how do you do all this? For this, you need a furnace. The furnace is an evolution. It's nothing that it says, oh, wait, let's build and design a furnace. It came slowly. It started like the bloomery just heating and hammering the, the ore. And there was what they named the Catalan process from Catalonia and was in the Pyrenees that they were really with pipes blowing air into the, into the mixture just to make it hotter. And then they started using some type of fans. There were many different types that they were set. And finally, in evolution. And if you see today the production of iron, the big iron furnace is still used today in Pittsburgh and in other places around the world, they are similar in design. They have other type of that. They have indirect heating, direct heating, but at the end, it goes practically to the end to establish some chemical reactions. The chemical reactions weigh mainly the carbon and the oxide and the oxygen produce carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So can you imagine all those fumes that came up out of here of the furnace with a lot of carbon monoxide? The carbon monoxide reacted with the iron ore and produced the iron and carbon monoxide. Those are the basic chemical reactions. But if we go further, the chemical reactions are much more complicated. And in one of my future presentations that I'm planning to do, I will go a little more into the chemistry of making iron. How does it work? They built a furnace here in the middle with special bricks, fire resistant bricks. And outside they put stone, sand, and a structure in order to keep it in their form. They needed also to inject air through this two year, a nozzle. And at that time in Colonial, they didn't have what we use today, like a compressor with pistons. They used bellows, moved with water power. And a bridge that was used to feed all the different ingredients. They started heating up the furnace, burning for about a week charcoal, burning and burning until it came to the right temperature. Once it came to the right temperature, they started adding the ore, more charcoal, limestone, and continue so for practically 12 hours. That was the cycle more or less that worked for a furnace. This furnace had to run for 
seven days a week, 24 hours. They couldn't stop. If they stopped, everything gets here like a huge rock that was named also as a salamander, and they had to destroy the whole furnace. If the furnace needed some maintenance, what they had to do is empty all the iron, all the slack here in the bottom, the molten iron, and continue burning charcoal in order to clean as much as possible. Then they were able to stop it for maintenance if needed. What do they did with the iron that, came, that was molten? The iron came here on the side into this, what they named it, the casting room. And in this casting room was filled with sand. Somebody came before tapping, that's the name that they used to make a hole in the furnace to, so that the liquid iron came out. And they make little channels in the sand. You will see a picture later of that. And the sand went directly there. If they wanted to cast pots or pans, etc., they prepared their molds and they had a way to get the liquid iron out of the furnace and put it into the molds and make the different type of um, items that they needed. Those bellows, they opened and closed through a cam that was here in the middle of the uh, axle of the um, water wheel. And when it dropped, it injected the air. And this weight that was on this side, when the cam passed the, the bellow, it opened the bellow again. So it, that was a way to have it on a continuous way, opening and closing. And normally they had two bellows normally. Why? Because one bellow was injecting air and the other was opening so that they were working in synchronization and so the airflow into the furnace was continuously. As you see here, the temperature was really high and it was necessary. Here's the crucible and the slag was normally, it's dense, more dense than the liquid iron, so it was always swimming in the surface. Periodically, they took that slag out once it was cool, they break, broke it in little pieces, and it was used for the roads, tapping the furnace. That's what they use here. This is the man tapping here the furnace. And you see here the iron, the channels that they built. And they name it pig iron. The reason of the name pig iron, tradition says, inclusive, is used also in Europe, also in German. They say this, or the same, that it's pig iron. And because that's the saw with the little sucklings on the side. So that was all the pig iron. If, if they needed casting something, they did it on this side. And they were then used and breaking the cast. And then they had their pots. <coughs> this, the, yeah? What was the cast made out of? Normally, it's also clay sometimes or sand. Yeah. It's interesting that the pig iron here, it's very simple. It was a small furnace, but there are pictures of uh, pig irons that was huge. And they had many 20, 30 different channels just for the, for the liquid iron. Now, Pedro Haas and Kleber arrived 1764. Why are you using that? Because he was the one who started really in the West Milford area, the production of iron. He arrived on June the 4th of 1764 in New York City. He found that the Ringwood, in the newspaper, that the Ringwood Iron Works were for sale. And he bought it immediately, moved there. And by the end of the year, he was already producing iron. Who was he? He was a German. but. German, England, colonies, how does that match? He lived for many years in Lisbon and in Cadiz in Spain and Portugal. And he got married with an English lady, the daughter of a sea captain. And he became later also English. And he found that 
talking to the captains and sea people in the post ports because he was dedicated to export and input goods in those two huge cities. He found that and heard that there were so many opportunities around the new continent for producing many things. And he heard then suddenly, and also iron. And he knew about England having problems needing to import iron from other countries because they were running out of woods to make the charcoal. So he got a special permit from the British government together with two partners, partners and established the American company. Some people asked here the American Iron Company, and many people said, oh, it was the Ringwood Company. No, Ringwood Company was something completely apart. The Ogdens were the ones who had the Ringwood Company, and that company still exists today in Ringwood. There is a Ringwood Company making other stuff. But that company, the same exists up to today. But his company was the American Company, Occasionally, in books, they name it the American Iron Company. He was then who wanted to rebuild Ringwood, Charlottenburg, and the Long Pond Iron Works. Why do I mention Charlottenburg and Long Pond only? Because I said they were the only ones in what is today West Milford. Charlottenburg is also discussed with Morris County because it's at the border, at the Pequannock River. And Pequannock River has been one of the um, borders between West Milford, Passaic County, and, and Morris County. So that's one of the reasons that there is the fight a little bit. But originally, he was, they were built here in what is West Milford. He built not only what you will see a lot of uh, constructions, but he also built a lot of roads. He had to move all the materials. He has to remove the people. He has to move the iron out to be sold. He has to bring materials also for living like wheat. So they had to import the flour. So they had to bring everything here, many roads, bridges, and a lot of dams. That was one of his main inventions, dams here in the area, in order to increase the size of the lakes or the ponds or the whatever they had here, in order to get water supply for a longer period of time. <coughs> and he imported more than 40, 540 Germans. There's a big discussion. If there were 540 workers, or were 540 workers and the family members, Nobody knows that. I have been trying together with uh, Ralph Colfax from the North Jersey Highlands Historical Society to establish a better number. OK, let's see how many workers in Long Pond, how many workers here, how many miners, how many colliers to make charcoal. So <clears throat> we haven't come to a conclusion yet. <clears throat> but we can say that he established to self-sufficient communities that at least, at least everyone, each one had over 150 workers. That's for sure. And something interesting also at Charlottenburg, they had the first strike in America. The Germans started complaining that we're not paying enough because, of course, there were also Americans, but not Americans, colonists working together says, oh, they don't pay you, because they came indented. Right. So they had to pay back. And so they started complaining, and they had to strike, and he had to increase his salaries. Where are the mines? I will go closer, because I don't. This is the New Jersey, New York border. Long Pond here, very close to Greenwood Lake. Charlottenburg here, by the Pequannock River. And that's another one that includes more up to 
to the Mohawk River because Hassan Kleber came also with the idea to establish plantations at the Mohawk River, the famous German flats. There were Germans already there before, and he saw that was a good opportunity for hemp, flax, plantations there, and also to make potash in that area. I visited that about five years ago, and we found several places, inclusive there's a Hassan Kleber Hill there, and there's recognition that he was there also. So he really had, they name it an empire. And that's maybe the reason that in some books they say, oh, Baron Hassan Kleber, they name it a Baron. Because he said that he was like a Baron because he had an empire. That was, but that's not just somebody came with that idea. Long point. You will see that Long Pond was not small. There was only one furnace and one forge, but they had two coal houses, two blacksmiths, four frame houses, six log houses, and they had also a lot of other things that they needed in order to be self-sufficient. Paul Frost, the president of the Friends of the Longport Airworks, Works, one winter, because you have to go only in, in winter or early spring when the vegetation has not grown, and he found many of the foundations, and he identified all of them, the red spots of all the items mentioned by Hassan Clever. Those lists come from a booklet that he wrote when he was accused by his English partners of misusing the money, he wrote a book for his own defense, and he mentioned that list. And that list was later also corroborated by um, William Franklin, governor of New Jersey, the son from Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. in, in a special survey that he asked for. So you can see there were a lot of people working there. Now, Longpont, as we can compare later, was smaller really than Charlottenburg. But why did he build Longpont? Why did he move away from Ringwood if they already had in Ringwood an ironworks? Not enough water. Then he wanted to build more and produce more. And he found that Greenwood Lake and the Wanaki River was one of the best resources of water that he had. Then he bought that. But then he discovered also the Pequannock River, where Route 23 and Echo Lake is in that area. He found that also there. And he said, OK, that's another opportunity. And what he built there, you will see it's much larger than at Long Pond. This is a schematic of a book that was an archaeological study that was made of Long Pond. <coughs> You see the Wanaki River coming down, and then he built there a pond with a special dam that he built in order to have more water. Then the furnace, and at the end, the water continued flowing. Practically, as exactly as it is today, there is no major difference. The interesting thing is that he built also from the Wanaki. Uh, from the um, Wanaki River, very close to Greenwood Lake, Greenwood Lake Long Pond, by the way, he built a canal to bring the water into his pond because he wanted to put the water, after passing the water wheels, directly back into the river. He had to have the canal. In the seven, 1960s, Roland Robinson, archaeologist, was able to find the remains of the furnace that you see there in the back on the link. And on the right side, the furnace and the casting room, this is what you can see in this picture there that they found. Unfortunately, when this was done, the park practically abandoned Long Pond and practically that furnace disappeared. We have been trying to keep it alive, trying to maintain it, but unfortunately, it lost its shape practically 
totally. The picture in the bottom is similar to the one I used in the first part. That's what we think more or less is the way Long Pond looked in the 1770s, more or less. Charlottenburg. Charlottenburg was much larger. You see only, only comparing seven frame houses and 37 lock houses for the workers. It was much larger than what it was before. And it included the furnace on the left, the water coming from what is Echo Lake, at that time it was Macopin Lake, come to the furnace, then there's the middle forge and the other forge in the bottom. The middle forge is more or less about half a mile, less than half a mile from the north entrance to the, um, uh, what's the community on Route 20? Smoke rice. Smoke rice, yes. And the other one, forge, was most probably under the bridge, where Hamburg Turnpike goes under the bridge going into uh, uh, Bloomingdale. Smith Yeah, exactly, Smith Mills. Mm -hmm. This map was made by um, Robert Erskine, and he made a huge mistake. He named it the Pompton River, when it was really the Pequannock River. And many of the living quarters were in what is today German Town Road, where St. Joseph Church is. The only thing that we can see today and has been archaeological research by the North Jersey Highlands Historical Society was the Middle Forge. Because the furnace and all the coal houses and around the furnace are now underwater in the Charlottenburg um, Reservoir. Now we name it Charlottesburg, but originally it was Charlottenburg, that's the way it should be in Germany, and Charlotte was the Queen of England, the spouse of George III. And he was Germ she was German from Hanover and was one also of the investors with Peter Hasenclever, one of the one to give some money, and was the contact of Hasenclever occasionally with George III. One day, I, maybe I could make another presentation. It's about his writings. He wrote very interesting letters to England about that he was looking that they were going to run into problems with the colonies, the way they were handling the colonies, etc. And he wrote directly, but as they say, not taken into consideration, okay, maybe they fire me, who cares? He said what came out of his heart. And this was before the American Revolution. Yes, but he said, be careful. Interesting about him, he got in trouble with his partners and finally he lost all his money and went back to Germany with his daughter. His wife was very sick and she decided to stay in London. And several months after he passed away, he won in the courts of England against all his ex-partners. But for what? <laughs> he couldn't do anything more. This is on the left, it's a drawing that was made by the uh, survey that they did from the um, North Jersey Highland Historical Society. And the drawing on the right is what they think it looked based on their findings that they did the archeological um, research of Charlottenburg. I mentioned the report from uh, William Franklin the royal governor, because that's the way they describe him. I just put the governor, but it's really, they, he all, they always refer to him. Unfortunately, that report, supposedly there were two copies. One that went to the governor of New York, because he was also in good relationship with the governor of New York, Monroe, and with um, William uh, Franklin. And 
they, he requested when he was running in trouble with his partners to make an assessment of all the work. The only copy that we have is that was printed in his booklet that he wrote for his own defense. We have been looking, not only myself, other people, for the, to see if they are the original ones. They are lost, unfortunately. Inclusive, they have, we have been looking in Albany, we have been looking in New York City, we have been looking in Trenton, and no way, they not, doesn't exist. But if you read, they really were saying that he did a big job, that he really was able to achieve many things. And there have been also recognition of his achievements. One is the Longpond Iron Works, historic village of Hewitt, that was named later Hewitt because the Hewitt and Peter Cooper, they bought the property and continued producing iron during the Civil War. And the great Charlottenburg furnace track. And if you see, the one on the left is by the um, West Milford, and the one on the right is by Morris County. Because I said, okay, it was on our side. But really, it, when it was established, it was part of Bergen County, because the separation between Bergen County and Passaic County happened much later. And the limits were not well established. So there was historical acknowledgement by the town for all the work that he did. It's a proclamation about all that what he did. And I am always making a question for myself. Could be he considered as one of the founders of today's West Milford? I'm sure of that. Many people say, no, it's not necessary. There were other ones here before. But he was the first one who really established not just a hamlet. They were little towns, self-sufficient communities. So maybe one day we can get some recognition of that. This proclamation was the first step. I was the one who requested that, and I was able to get it at that time. The painting on the right, it's a different one to the one that is known here in West Milford and we have at Long Pond. This was, I found it in a museum in the city of Kamiena Gora, today Poland, that during the German Empire was Silesia. It was Landeshut, where he moved after he left England, and he passed away there. And they had it in the local museum there. My wife and I visited this, this place five years ago. And when I saw the drawing, the painting, it says it's a huge painting, more or less the size of that screen. I said, wow. Mm -hmm. But I, we noticed something, and the curator, was really not the curator, was the assistant curator of the museum, said, come, I will show you something. If you see the map that he is reading, it says America. He always wanted to come back to America, but he says, I'm too old. Inclusive, there is a, supposedly a letter written by Benjamin Franklin. It says, we recognize all what you did. Everything that you lost will be returned to you. Please come back to America. And says, I am too old for that. And here, as mentioned by Tanya, maybe in the future I can make another small presentation about this, about basic iron or smelting history. There was made for mines because there were mines here. The charcoal making. So there are ideas maybe for the future that I can, because I, I will never stop with this. I know me. <laughs> Thank you.